So we go take a walk. And he says, oh, I was told you were coming. I looked at him. I'd never seen him before. He had long hair, you know, just like a Native American would. You know, and uh, he said, uh, behind you is uh, Archangel Michael, St. Germain, and uh, the high priest of Telos, Dama. I looked at him like my hair on my neck, uh, you know, raised. And he goes, but I was sent here to protect you. I go, protect me. He goes, yeah, because uh, he says there are a lot of people that don't want, you know, your discoveries to come out. So uh, he said, but I need to share some things with you. So he then went and shared with me uh, the oral history of his people. And he said the, the native stories is that his people had come out of the mountain and his people were at, out of Mount Rainier, but he says Rainier, Shasta, and all the, the Cascade mountain ranges uh, is where all the people came out from the hollow earth and they are descendants of these people. And he called them the tall ones. And he said, uh, so I asked him, you know, to describe them. He said, well, his grandparents would tell him about them, uh, them fishing in certain rivers. And uh, they were seven, eight feet tall, if not taller. Uh, they wore buckskin, uh, long hair. And he said that uh, they, uh, they, they were known to come out. And then uh, if people went near them, they would dematerialize. He said they all had the power of... Uh, to, you know, to change from the 3D to the 50, and you wouldn't see them, so they could just dematerialize uh, right before your eyes. And uh, so he did say to me, he said that, you know, everything that you, you, you say, because I had explained, you know, what brought me out to California, he says, you're on the right track. He goes, you will find what you're looking for. He says, but, uh, he goes, my people have, uh, you know, are going to, you know, look out for you, and we're going to make sure that, you know, you arrive on time, you arrive safely. So I, I took what he said seriously because how in the world, you know, he knew I was coming, how in the world, you know, why, why would he even share some of these things with me on the oral history of his people? I mean, we talked about Bigfoot, we, we talked about a number of other things, and uh, he, made, he gave me validation even on Bigfoot, which was interesting because uh, that's something that I, you know, I, I never really looked into. I mean, um, I heard of Bigfoot, I, you know, I don't know that it exists, but uh, he, he made sure that I understood that not only uh, does Bigfoot exist, he gave me an interesting story to tell me that, you know, he's seen one and his, and his friends have one uh, right near the Olympia Forest that comes and would steal salmon out of a smoker. Hmm. So what his friend did was modify the smoker and put the, the plexiglass door higher up so that way when Bigfoot would come, he could reach in only after he could see that the, the salmon was cooked and take it rather than before when it was lower, just take it before it was done. So it was interesting that the fellow, even Native American, even modified the smoker for Bigfoot. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. And, and once I was, and I, I, I'll share something, we'll go on the limb here. I'm, I'm praying ceremoniously in, uh, in the sweat lodge while I was up there in, uh, in your state, in Washington, and... Uh, in the, uh, the ceremonial sweats, it's like seven rounds that, you know, uh, we were going through. But about third or fourth round is when you get to the nitty-gritty and things start to get to dis discussed and uh, a lot of things that the white man won't hear. And one of the things they were praying for was for Bigfoot, that uh, he would, you know, be safe and uh, stay out of harm's way and not, you know, uh, not be hurt from, uh, you know, people trying to, uh, to take him as a prize. So, I mean... Uh, you know, with my own ears, you know, I was able to hear this. So it made me realize that, you know what, you know, here I am in ceremony for this to come out. There's got to be some truth to it. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I think that uh, the Bigfoot uh, legends throughout the world, uh, that kind of lends credence in my book. It, it kind of adds to the evidence of the hollow earth. Uh, uh, why else would nothing be found on the surface? So I think they're a subterranean or a inner earth creature, personally. Well, I, I agree 100% with you. Uh, and uh, I'll share a story that uh, I shared with Ramon only after. Uh, I'm going to just tell you guys that uh, James Gilliland uh, wants to say hello to both of you. He says, uh, I should say hello to both of you and, and uh, <laughs> say hello to you, you two crazy guys. <laughs> <laughs> That would be us. 
Yeah. So I uh, okay, I will pass it on, but I'll do it in a, uh, in a in a lovingly fashion. But being I mentioned his name, I'm going to share a story. And uh, this happened right after uh, I came up to uh, Olympia, Washington. I went down to his ranch, and his ranch is in Trout Lake, Washington. And I was going to stay at his ranch for three days. Uh, and so this is August now of uh, 2008. And uh, while on his ranch, the first night, about 30 people assembled out in, in the field there. And uh, if people don't know that his East City Ranch is known uh, to have UFO activity above his ranch, which is uh, in a close proximity uh, to uh, Mount Adams, another uh, large mountain range uh, in, uh, in Washington. So we're, we're out, 30 of us, and we're looking up at the night sky. And we're able to see some UFOs that night. We're out about two hours, it was 8 till about 10, and around 10 o'clock it started to rain very hard. So everybody scattered, and I had a tent, and my girlfriend had a tent, uh, right out in the open field, and uh, we went to bed, and uh, sleeping about four hours, and uh, all of a sudden <clears throat> I see a figure over my tent. It must have been about eight or nine feet tall. I see the shadow, this ominous presence above my tent, and I had the, the little zipper pocket in the front of the tent. I quickly zipped it open to see what, what was looming outside of my tent. I thought it might be bear or, or what could it be, but it looked human the way it was, you know, just posturing over my tent. By the time I opened the zipper, I couldn't see it in the darkness. So I got out my shoes, I got my flashlight, and as I, I came out of the tent, I heard the dogs barking on the property. I heard about 20 people just all yelling, like, you know, commotion, like something had happened. So I w went out investigating from 2 o'clock in the morning, and I stayed up about 5.30. So me and this fellow, we were sitting out in the field there just looking like, what could that have been? And uh, he was saying, it's the tall ones, you know, they were here. And I was like, well, I don't know what it was. I just saw the shadow. So about 5.30, my friend came over to where we were sitting, and then she said that when I, I left the tent, she thought I went out to relieve myself. And when she looked out into the open field, there was a figure there. But after studying it, it was about eight feet tall. And the figure looked back, and she looked out, and she was really, that's not Stephen. And she realized that here it was, this tall, ominous presence staring back at her. And they had this stare, stare down for about 15 minutes, and the whole time she said that she just kept sending it love, saying, you know, you know please don't hurt me, whatever. And uh, she was, said she was just like almost like hypnotized by what she was viewing. So when I saw her at 5.30 in the morning, she relayed, you know, the story. And I says, well, I saw it. Other people are telling me they know what it was. And uh, so when about 8.30 in the morning rolled around, I ran into James on the property. And I said, James, you're not going to believe what happened last night. He goes, yeah, I know. He goes, my sister saw it too. So, <laughs> so uh, I, uh, <laughs> at least I had validation, you know, that, you know, uh, it was something that was just, you know, uh, unbelievable. And uh, I, I don't know how I would have reacted to it had I actually seen it because it was 2 o'clock and I just opened the zipper and, you know, to have something staring at you like that, I mean, you know, I could have had a heart attack. I don't know what it would happen, but I just know that, you know, it wasn't of the world that, I would, that I'm known to experience at the time. But I did get validation in the morning that, you know, uh, there are, you know, uh, there are Lemurians and they're out there. And I guess, you know, I'll, I'll I'll give, know I was going to say, I'll... I'll give you a quick story to validate yours. Um, my first night there in 2009, I went for the conference. And from the corner of my eye, I kept seeing this tall being that was taller than everybody else. And I remember I mentioned it to James, and he says, oh, yeah, the, they'll be in the crowd. But you can only see them if you're, if you're with the, your peripherals or if your eyes are, are you know, trained to see auras. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's definitely something really tall up there because you keep seeing somebody who's really tall and then you look and it's just the regular people. And then, you you know, you're looking well, at the sky again. And Well, I was just up in uh, Oregon, um, up in Ashland, uh, probably uh, this summer. 
And I was talking to someone relating a story like I'm, I am to you guys about J.C. Brown and Lemurians. And this person was clairvoyant, and they looked around outside of the tent where, where, where we were talking. She said there were three Lemurians that were standing out there curious as to what I was saying and nodding in agreement like, yeah, I'm right. And I turned around. I didn't see them, but her and another woman who, who were listening, they both had seen them. And they, so they made them themselves appear to them, but not to me. But they wanted to validate that I was on the right track. Nice. Mm. Nice. So since we... So oh, we're yeah. uh, we're we're nearing the top of the uh, our first hour here. We're going to do another hour with Stephen in our archives on the website. Uh, I want to give you a chance, Stephen, to uh, talk about some of the projects that you've got going on and some of the new stuff, and get out your website and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the first thing I want to get out is that uh, because I'm starting my interview process up here for 2011, I th think it's important that I get out my Sindoni says. Uh, website so it's s i n d o n i says s a y s dot webs dot com so sindoni says dot webs dot com and on this site i've got the ability for you to go on to skype and talk to me directly it's uh it, it, uh, ten, nine ninety nine for ten minutes you can buy blocks of time and i'll answer any questions anybody wants and i'll do it on skype but they can go to that site and they, they can pay through PayPal or they can use credit cards because I want to get the word out to as many people as possible. And because of the things that I do, it's, 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 not, it's, not hard, it's pretty hard for me to have a nine to five based on the, the things I talk about. So this is the way I, I want to generate income. And part of the proceeds would go to a nonprofit organization. So that's sindonisays.webs.com. I also have another website. Uh, it's my name, Stephen Sindoni, with a P-H-E-N, sindoni.webs.com, both on webs.com. That also gives you uh, interviews. You can hear, uh, I believe I have interviews with uh, George Norrie. You can hear a coast-to-coast -coast interview. You can buy products and merchandise there. And there's also a YouTube site that you can go to uh, at Sindoni Productions, where I have about 100 movies out that you can watch uh, different movies on different topics, a number of topics. So it's pretty three places that you can go to, but the Sindoni says dot webs dot com will be a place that people can go to if they want to schedule time with me to talk about any of the things, uh, whether it be legends, mysteries or, or conspiracies or more. I'm I'm gonna allow people to uh you know, be able to, to get a hold of me in that way and uh, clear up some of these things that have uh, been uh, I guess uh, buried for a number of years. So we'll have all those links on the BBS, uh, on our page on BBS, and we'll have them linked in the, uh, on uh, the Stephen page on our website in the archives. Well, yeah, all you awesome. have to I do really is uh, click on his photo, and I'll take you right to his website. Oh, what were you saying, Stephen? Well, I, I thank you guys for allowing that to happen, because as I said, I mean, this, this information is, uh, needs to come out, and I think... Uh, it's time the masses uh, get a wake-up call. Yep. So we're going to continue this in, in our archive section, and uh, uh, we're going to go into some of the, the uh, inner earth stuff and uh, talk about a lot of the stuff going on there, some of the old the legends and, and uh, things going on, uh, the evidence for uh, our, our hollow earth. So uh, I hope everybody... Uh, pops on over and joins us on the uh, website uh, to uh, continue this great interview. Yeah, and um, make sure, don't believe anything you hear. Do the research yourself. And if, if you research into a lot of the things we talk about on the show, you, you'll be amazed. Um, Tom? Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. So. And I always say, if you believe in 50% of what you hear and investigate the other 50% and then discern the truth for yourself. There we go. All right. Good night, everybody. Uh, we'll see you in the archives. Cool.